year. Uh, yes, a, a wide brush move. I've spent most of the last five years just at home with my kids, so I'm just trying to fill in what I hope to do in the future once they're at school. Uh, now, is this, is this working? Yes. Yeah. There we go. Good. Okay. Let's angle this. Let's see. Right. Um, now, I've included uh, the University of York and the University of Cambridge on, on there, um, although I don't uh, work for anyone at the moment. Um, this talk is based on research I did while working for those institutions. Um, so I'm a zooarchaeologist, and what I do is I look at fish bones. Um, and I have looked at um, the fishing in the Northern Isles um, through looking at the story that the bones themselves tell. And I, I have a particular focus on Orkney, as I did um, a lot of research on Orkney fish bones for my PhD. Um, what I looked at, um, what I have looked at in the past, is the intensive fishing in the Viking Age and medieval periods, um, and those are in particular at the cod rich fish middens um, in the, the Northern Isles, and they, they tell a, a, a very distinctive story about um, a real intensification of fishing, um, and it's a story that James touched upon on his, in his keynote talk this morning. So that forms the very beginning of my talk, but what I would like to focus on is the later transition to small-scale subsistence level fishing um, a few centuries after that major intensive Norse fishing. And I'm going to look at why, I'm going to look at some of the dates, some of the fishing methods used, and I will discuss some of the reasons why we see this big transition. And then later on I'd also like to look at the evidence we have for the herring boom. It's very well documented, people talk about it all the time but there are almost no herring bones turning up in the archaeological records. So I'd lo like to talk about why there is this complete absence of herring bones in, in Orkney and Shetland. Um, right, the fish event horizon is what James was talking about this morning, though he didn't actually call it that, but, um, but he, he initially used that term, but he didn't use it in his paper this morning. Um, the fish event horizon is the, the rapid and widespread increase in marine fishing, fish trade and fish consumption, um, particularly cod and herring, that we see throughout Viking Age Europe from about 1080 onwards. And we can certainly identify it using zooarchaeology as well as isotopes, and we can see that people are massively increasing the amount of marine protein in their diet after this, uh, this time. Um, and I'll just gloss over some of the reasons for, for why we have this big fish event horizon. And again, James spoke about this this morning. Um, we have things like the um, increase in Christianity requiring people to only eat fish or marine foods um, for many days of the year. Um, we have a rise in um, urban populations that need to be fed, and one way of feeding these increasing populations is through fish. Um, at the same time, we have a lot of restrictions on river systems. Um, say in areas in England, when there's increasing urbanization, people want to eat fish, but the local river systems can't keep up with demand. Um, and at the same time, there's a lot of water mills being put on rivers and restrictions as to just how many fish you can get out of those rivers, which puts an increased demand on marine um, fish resources from the sea from areas like Orkney. At the same time, we have the medieval warm period that is um, conducive to um, good fishing conditions um, and the good availability of fish. And we see a, a big rise in the trade of preserved fish, as shown in this picture here. Um, preserved fish can be traded at long distances, um, and they can be prepared in areas like Orkney and um, uh, Arctic Norway and Iceland, and traded down into um, England and onto the continent as well. Um, and I'll mention briefly Koi Room, um, where there's a, a lovely fish midden of. Um, uh, well, Viking Age Norse date, and this fish min um, shows the intensification of fishing that occurred around 1000 AD. Um, in the lower bit of the midden, um, there's a sort of darker, there's a darker area that you can see there, where there's this 9th and 10th century date, so there's mixed midden material, there's some fish, but there's also lots of mammal bone, and in the upper bit of that midden, um, it's you can certainly see all the shells coming out in that picture. Those shells are being used for bait. That's 11th to 14th century date. Lots of very large cod and ling. Um, and these are fish bones shown in the picture down there. Um, and uh, there's also some mammals, but also seabirds that they're probably catching well um, uh, in association with fishing. Um, 
Um, Errol's Blue is another site that I've looked at, and it's an elite settlement on Orkney's mainland. Um, there's a lot of mid midden material associated with the horizontal mill, um, and this site has a similar focus on large cod, cod family fish, some of which was probably arriving at Earl's Boo already prepared, um, maybe coming from sites like Koi Roo, which is a fairly typical farm. Um, and the Earl's Boo being a higher status site, they probably collected rents and renders and taxes, and probably some of that payment was arriving in the form of, of dry prepared fish. Um, now what I'd really like to talk about is what happens after the fish event horizon. Um, there are very few sites that have any quantity of fish remains, um, so there's an interesting gap before the historical records kick in in, in detail. Um, and Koigru is one of those exceptions. It has a, a lot of uh, mid material from the 15th and 16th century um, date, and in that midden we see small safe becoming the real focus for all fishing effort. Um, there's almost no big cod family fish anymore. So there's a real focus on shallow and inshore waters only. And there's another site I'd like to talk about called Stacklebray, uh, which is on Edie. And this is a site that's very recently excavated um, by Orca um, in Orkney. Um, and that excavation has produced about 6,000 identified fish remains, which makes it a fairly important site for filling this gap before historical records come in. Um, and the midden material includes um, fish from the late medieval and post-medieval periods, and there's also a, a very tiny bit of classic um, Norse fish midden at the very bottom um, of the, the rescue excavation. And you can see that it's a... I hope you can sort of make out the bottom picture shows the coastal erosion of this site, um, and they were able to get in and um, rescue some of this. And once they cleared back, they um, exposed the re remains of a rather nice, um, relatively high status structure. Um, as well as some associated artifacts. And this, this site hasn't been fully published yet, but um, I, I think ORCA will probably bring it to publication very soon. Um, uh, the, the midden material extends up into the 19th century, um, where there's some fish bones associated with the final um, abandonment of the, the site. Um, but what's particularly important is the, um, the 15th to mid 17th century material when the site was probably fairly high status. Um, and then after that period, the, from the mid-17th and 18th centuries, there's, there's still a settlement at the site, but it's not as high a status as it was before. Um, and what we have at Stacklebray is we have some large cod and, and safe in the earlier phases, um, but small safe come to dominate in the later phases. And the, the picture there shows some of the, the typical fish remains from the later phases where, um, unfortunately, it's kind of the scale at the bottom, but um, most of the, these little vertebrae you can see are just maybe three or four millimeters. Um, the, the preservation is excellent, um, which has helped in the analysis. Um, now, the, the interesting thing is when this transition occurred from, from fishing deeper waters for large cod to switching to fishing just the inshore um, waters for small safe. And, Certainly this transition had happened by the mid-17th century, the, the larger cod and safe had disappeared almost completely, and the focus was then on fishing the small safe from inshore waters. But the, the 15th to mid-17th century phase is a bit more interesting because there is a mix of medium and large cod, as well as quite a bit of small safe. Um, but it certainly doesn't have the very large fish typical of the Norse period. And what's interesting is there's only one herring bone, and that's from a mid-17th to 18th century phase. Um, but it, Stacklebury is certainly contemporary with the herring room, and it's very interesting that it's just this one herring. Um, now, what's also different about Stacklebury is that about a quarter of all the small safe um, mouth bones were butchered, and I haven't seen this at any other site. And the picture over here, this shows some of the maxilla bones. Um, they're each maybe two or three centimeters long, and uh, some excellent bush remarks underneath, but please replace the filter a bit. Um, these, those are cut marks. Um, and the, you see on the fish head down there, there's some red marks that show where these cut marks are happening. And I have no idea why they would be butchering their safe like this. And I would love, if anyone has any ideas about why they were butchering their safe, I would love to know. And it was probably happening when the fish were, were freshly caught. Um, the, there's certainly evidence from the later period that um, small safe was strung up to be um, smoked or dried, and they probably string them up 
on sticks, like you see in the top picture. This is from one of the Orkney Farm Museums. And they were pushing the sticks through into the, the back of the throat and out through the mouth. So you'd actually want those mouth bones to be fairly strong if you're doing this. You wouldn't really want to be cutting the mouth bones. But if anyone has any ideas about why this butchery practice was going on, please let me know. I'd love to hear it. Um, so I'll just summarize graphically some of the changing cod and save sizes through time. Uh, this, this only two slides with <coughs> lots of data. Um, the, oh, please replace the filters right over my little pie graphs that show the proportions of cod and safe. Um, but I'll just summarize the, the changing cod sizes through time. So to start with the koi grew, um, oh, I should say this is, these were made just using um, fish that were from saved um, contexts. And these were all analyzed by me using the same methods, so that cuts out um, the variability you get with different types of sieving or with different um, types of analysis being done. So um, at Koi Gru, at the, the peak of the fish event horizon in the 11th to 13th centuries, there's lots of very large cod. Certainly, well over half of the cod are, are at least 80 centimeters long, and it's a significant portion of really big cod over a meter long. And then at, at Koi Gru in the 15th and 16th century, there's only very few cod caught. The, um, I do apologize, it's very hard to see the, the bottom bit. Uh, basically, in the 15th and 16th century at Koi Gru, they're catching almost entirely small safe, but the few cod that are there are a variety of, of different sizes. Um, if we look at Stafford right then, the 15th to mid 17th century phase, um, cod represent about half of all the fish caught. And there's a variety of sizes, but there aren't any of those really big cod of over a meter. Um, but by the mid-17th to early 19th centuries, the, the few cod that are caught are fairly small. They're not being caught in the, in the open, deeper waters anymore. And just to compare, this is as close as I could get to using some modern data. This was taken from fishing off of Shetland. And they're fishing using gear that doesn't catch any of the small fish less than 30-odd centimeters. So, it is biased, but it does show that now there are very few of the really big cod that were quite typical in the past, so that we are seeing um, indications of overfishing um, in the present day. But that's, that's an entirely different story that I won't get into right now. Um, if I'll just uh, review the changing safe sizes through time as well, um, what, we, what we see is basically the safe getting smaller and smaller. Um, certainly by the, the final phase of Staffelbray, mid 17th to early 19th century phase, almost all of the safe are between 15 and 30 centimeters, but there's also a significant portion that are very small, they're less than 15 centimeters. These are very, very young fish, and I don't think they would have been very tasty, but if there's no other food available, they'd certainly use it. Um, so what we're seeing is the rise of silex and piltox, or I think up here it would be silex and piltax, but my accent's not quite right. Um, so we see fish middens falling out of use in the 13th and 14th centuries, and people similarly reduced their marine protein consumption about then. Fishing moves inshore, small safe are being used for food, but also small safe are a very important source of fish oil. Uh, it's used for lighting and for, for payments as well. And this transition isn't yet that well dated, but it's definitely occurred at Koi Group by the 15th and 16th centuries. And at Stackle Bray, this transition to small fish took place um, probably a little bit later, because we have a mix of different types of fishing going on between the 15th and 17th centuries. And this may be correlated with status, because Stackle Bray seems to have been an important settlement with some connections in the 15th to 17th century. So they may have had the, the technology and the wherewithal to buy in or to go out fishing in slightly deeper waters for bigger cod. Um, so, turning the question around, why do we have such a massive reduction in fishing for large cod family fish? Well, if I were looking at this time period, say, in, if, we were to, if we were to take these bones and put them in the prehistoric period, and if you were to just look at the story from the bones, you'd, you'd think it was a classic case of overfishing. I think there's a lot of other factors at play here, though. I don't think it's just that people have fished out the large cod. There's, uh, there's many other factors going on. There certainly is a lot of environmental decline about this time, and Iceland and Shetland both documented fishing failures and shifting fishing grounds, and I think we'll hear a little bit more about that later today uh, from Astrid. Um, now, technologies change as well. 
Inshore fishing for small faith doesn't need big ocean-going boats, um, and it doesn't need the dedicated knowledge of the sea and the tide and the weather. And certainly by the 18th century, the small faith are described as an absolute staple food uh, for the very poor people, and they certainly don't have the ability to, to make or buy big boats and, and invest in fishing gear. They are just fishing from the shore um, um, using minimal gear. Um, and at the same time, we have other areas like Iceland and Arctic Norway who are able to supply the, the in, huge increase in demand for large preserved cod family fish. Say, urban centers like London are demanding um, large quantities of, of prepared, preserved fish that Orkney isn't able to supply anymore. There's a lot of social changes going on at this time, as well as the Black Death and famine in the 14th century, reducing populations. And there's certainly a change in focus from the Nordic world towards the Scottish world. Um, so fishing for silix and piltox is less risky than fishing deeper waters for large cod and ling and haddock. And fishing for silix and piltox can also fit in around agricultural and kelp making demands. And it doesn't require the investment in boats and gear. Um, there is a question though that we're looking at only one particular type of archaeological site at the moment. So are we just tracing domestic level consumption? Well, it's certainly possible. Um, because the historical records show that some open water fishing for large cod and ling must have been taking place. And certainly we have German merchants in Shetland buying up fish in the 16th and 17th centuries. And then the 18th century, Shetland half fishery for deeper water large cod and ling. But both of those fisheries take place where men will often leave the, the domestic family setting and they will have an intensive fishing station um, where the fishing takes place. So if we're just digging up the remains of domestic meals, those big fish are not necessarily making it back home. Those big fish are probably being traded um, to the, the landlords. Um, and we have various 18th century archive records mentioning that a few tons of dried cod and ling were exported now and then from Orkney. Um, so there, there's a, a small degree of, of fishing deeper waters around Orkney, but we also, in 1769, there's a, a reference to a merchant importing a whole ship full of preserved cod from Newfoundland, and he imported that into Strom Nest. So there must have been some demand that for cheap dried fish that perhaps just could not be met um, locally, maybe. There's only one account of this import of fish, so it would be interesting to know what people thought about that. Um, so last few minutes, I'll, I'll talk a bit about where are the herring bones? And herring bones are really common finds in archaeological sites. And this example is a handful from a site in York. Um, I think it's 14th or 15th century date. Most of those bones you can see are herring. They survived really well. Um, you can count them. You can look at preservation methods by which bit of the fish we have and which bit we don't have. And we certainly get them in the, in the tens, of thousands, tens of thousands from medieval urban settlements in England. Now, Orkney and Shetland, well, Orkney particularly, but also Shetland, have some fairly good bone preservation, and there's lots and lots of tiny bones surviving in Orkney. So, if we're getting little fish like sand eels surviving, if the herring were there, they would survive. Um, and to give an example of numbers, that Coigre looked at over 80,000 fragments of fish bone, and only 57 of them were herring. And um, James Baird and I looked at over 60,000 fragments from Earl's Boo, and there are only 24 were herring. Um, and out of a few hundred thousand fish bones that other people have looked at as well, in the Northern Isles, there's only 195 herring bones. So something interesting is going on. Uh, so contemporary fishing in other areas around the North Sea certainly involved fishing for herring. And herring fishing is talked about in the Icelandic sagas. And herring as I said, are extremely common elsewhere. So why are there no herring bones in Orkney and Shetland? Was it that the herring were unpredictable? Yes, they probably were. You certainly heard that earlier today. Um, was it too difficult to deal with the catch before it, spo it spoiled? And if they're going out fishing and they happen to catch 10,000 herring, then they would need to do some sort of preservation of them, um, because they do spoil very quickly. Um, is it the lack of nets? Yes, possibly. Um, hook and lines we used to catch large cod family fish, and you can certainly, if you're fishing for sake, you can, um, it's various ethnographic accounts of just using hooks and lines or using small net like things that you can just put in the water from the shore from small boats. So you do need a different type of gear. Um, so the other question, I suppose, is were the herring even around Orkney and Shetland? 
Um, there's an account of the islands of Orkney by Wallace, which, which dates to 1700, and he says that herring swim through these islands in great plenty, but the people are not so frugal or have not the way to catch them. Some years ago, many ships from Fife frequented this country for the catching of herrings, um, uh, but they're gone, and since that time, the trade failed, though the Hollanders, to our eternal reproach, fail not to keep it up to their great advantage. So yes, there's herring around the Orkney. The Dutch are coming over and taking them all. Well, taking lots, not all of them, certainly. And the local people are not fishing them. Um, so we know the Dutch were fishing around the North Sea, and they were preserving the herring on board. And they followed the herrings, um, following their seasonal migration uh, from Shetland and down um, through the, the North Sea. And um, in the early 17th century, there's um, some complaints that the Dutch were fishing too close to the shore, so there was a, a restriction was put on that, that the Dutch, Dutch had to keep um, outside of 14 miles of the, the Scottish shoreline. Though the Dutch just got around this by paying for the right to fish, which uh, suited everyone probably. Um, and there's certainly records from 1619, 1633, and 1642 describing Dutch boats paying for the right to fish herring around Orkney, and they were actually paying. Um, in Stronsay, which later became a major herring port, they were paying their, their rentals in there. Um, and Barry says that there were plenty of fish in the sea, uh, the herring shores were an inexhaustible treasure around Orkney in August, but we are either destitute of time, capital, or industry to avail ourselves of this. And that was, he was writing in 1808. Um, so why did it take so long to develop Orkney's herring fishery? Well, there was certainly a focus on kelp making and agriculture and the fishing the silos and piltocks, the people didn't seem to have room to uh, introduce the herring fishery into their, their schedules, um, if you like, through the year. Um, there had certainly been a loss and a lack of local knowledge of the sea since the North period. And there was certainly a lack of investment locally needed for things like the landing stages, um, the docks, the barrel making, uh, boat building and maintenance. Um, and it, another big problem was the high costs and duties that was on salt at the time, and certainly the lack of local labour. Um, certainly thousands of people were needed once the herring fishery did get established. Uh, and in the early 19th century, Stronsay finally developed the funding and was able to develop as a centre for herring fishing in Orkney and then later on in Stromness. Um, so herring has always been a capricious fish, a source of legends and of shifting economic fort fortunes, and that's certainly true here. The final phases at Stackleberry are contemporary with Stronsay's herring industry, um, but no herring bones were found. And certainly there's a small sample size, there's not that many fish bones in that final phase. But certainly if you look at the um, census records or the early statistical account, you see a lot of people from ED are working in Stronsay on the herring fishery. So they might be working in the herring fishery, but they might not be able to bring any of those herring home, and they might not want to. Um, and then the Sackleberry's large mid-17th to early 19th century phase is also contemporary with Dutch fishing for herring off of Orkney, and certainly that, that fishery is probably taking place very close to E.D. and Stranse, but it doesn't appear that any of those herring are making their way to local sites. Um, although some of the the payments that the Dutch made for the right to fish may have trickled down locally. Um, so was this a deliberate choice or was there a, no mechanism for local people to access those herring? Um, there's lots of questions. I haven't got any answers. It would be nice if anyone had any ideas. Um, so just to summarize, we have the extensive cod family fisheries of the 10th, 11th and 12th centuries. We see them giving way to a much smaller scale inshore fishery for small save for local consumption. And this probably takes place during the 15th and 16th centuries at Koi Group, but slightly late, later at Stackleberry, which may um, correlate with the slight um, increase in, in perceived status at Stackleberry compared to Koi Group. Um, commercial deep water fishing for large cod and ling was definitely taking place in Shetland from the 16th century and in Orkney from at least the 18th on a small scale. But these aren't yet seen archaeologically at present. And of course, the big question is we're probably not looking at the, the right sites to pick that up archaeologically. Um, and the herring were around, but they were deliberately not fished until recently. Um, but what I'd really like to, to do is have a good rummage through a bin that dates from
from the last 600 or so years. And it'd be very interesting to look at some of the urban centers, say um, Kirkwall, um, or even excavate around the herring centers in Stromness or Stronse, and um, have a look at some mid material. Um, do they really focus on mid material on that date rather than seeing it incidentally through rescue excavation or seeing it as the, the tail end of the Norse fishing era? Um, so there's lots of work still to be done. Uh, and I'd like to, to thank uh, Southern Historic Scotland for funding the fish analysis from Staplebury and Orca for um, excavating Staplebury and providing unpublished information. Thank you very much, Jen, for that. Any questions for Jen?